This is my home. I'm going to tell you about a time that in reflection, I'm grateful to have come back. It was the summer of 2017 and my mind was playing tricks on me. I live with bipolar and sometimes it's not easy. At the time, I thought that those who loved me wanted to hurt me, so I ran away from what I thought was danger. In the midst of this mental health crisis, my father ran after me and my mom called 911 for help. With no shoes on, I ran past the video store, past the corner store, past my childhood best friend's house, past the library and towards the bustling streets of the Danforth. The problem is that I was doing this in the middle of the road. I decided to sit in the middle of this busy Toronto intersection as cars honked at me holding up traffic. A neighbor tried to help, but the police showed up and took over the scene. The police car swerved in front of me, trying to get me to stop as I got more scared and headed west. It was a dangerous game of cat and mouse as I ran while the police car continuously tried to cut me off. Then, once I ran past the church, I just stopped and sat down. They put me in an ambulance against my will, and looking back, I feel lucky to have not been hurt. I know that not everyone who goes through a mental health crisis in this city has the same outcome that I had. After things settled down, my mom actually thanked the police officers for not shooting me because she thought back to past tragic outcomes from within the city. More than not being hit by a car, I feel grateful that the police didn't see me as a threat and act aggressively. This documentary will explore the question of who should respond to mental health crises in Toronto. I want to understand how we can create less tragic outcomes for future generations when treating mental health crisis and answer the question, when we reach out for help, who should respond. We now go to our top story of the day from Mississauga, where a man was killed by police in his own home. 60-year-old Ejaz Chowdhury was suffering from schizophrenia and may have stopped taking his medication. Where the family of a 62-year-old man shot dead by police are demanding justice. What started as a wellness check on a father of four who suffered from schizophrenia ended with a violent and fatal encounter with police. This is where it happened. This is where the police shot Ijaz Chowdhury. When I heard the story of a 62-year-old father of four being killed in his own home, it made no sense. It's a perfect example of why the system is broken. We have to do better in a society in responding to people in need, whether they're old or young, whether they take medication or not. I want to give this community a platform to share how they feel in their words. This is part of a Father's Day vigil that this community held for Ijaz Chowdhury. They can say it much better than me. Again, I would like to thank everyone for coming out today for Uncle Ijaz's one year anniversary of his murder. where he was murdered from the police, he was taken away from the community. I just want to tell you guys a little bit about how I knew Uncle Ejaz in this community of Malton. Uncle Ejaz was a well-known community member. He was loved. He would always greet me with a nod in his head and with a smile while he was praying in the masjid, in the mosque. And when he was taken away from, from this community, from me knowing him as a person, it, des it devastated the community. It devastated the community so much that it brought, it brought everyone to our understanding that this is the reality of where we live in, in Canada. Just ask people around you. There's many, many stories that have occurred in this very same neighborhood. I've experienced a bit, seen some of it, and heard about even more. 
Being from a South Asian family, our view of the police was a bit different than some of our brothers and sisters of color. Our people generally believed and trusted in the system they immigrated to. They believed the pipe dream of freedom and equality, my own parents included. However, when they began raising the next generation in this country, they also learned. They learned it's all a lie. Now that the police have murdered a brown Muslim man, we all understand and feel the pain of our black brothers and sisters who have been suffering from the same thing for decades now. Rest in power to Jamal Francis and DeAndre Campbell and the countless others killed by the punk peel police. However, we are here to remember Uncle Ijaz today. His murder has changed us and Malton as a whole. We will always remember when our hood rose up and united against the system. We will never forget Uncle Ijaz. Through us, he will live forever. May Allah grant him paradise in the hereafter and watch over his family. The struggle continues. Thank you. I thought that it would be important to speak with someone who could highlight just how long this struggle has been going on for. John Sewell is a former mayor of Toronto and is a member of the Toronto Police Accountability Coalition, a watchdog of Toronto Police. We had a candid conversation over Zoom. When did you first realize that there were issues with how Toronto responds to mental health crisis in the city? Um, I think we responded, oh, about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. 2010, 2011, the city had set up um, a mobile crisis intervention team in 2005, sorry, the, the, the chief had, which consisted of uh, plainclothes officers and a mental health nurse. Um, but in fact, they were covering very, very small part of the city and only for one shift a day or something. Um, and so our group, Toronto Police Accountability Coalition, pushed very hard to, to try and get that expanded throughout the city. Uh, we made a number of deputations to um, the police services board, trying to get them to do it, and they never would. Um, and then, then, in fact, we realized, and this would probably be 2015, uh, that in fact, this mobile crisis intervention team was never the first responder. It was always attending after primary officers had come there and done whatever they had to do. And, and people were, were being killed. Two or three people every year who were in mental crisis were being killed in Toronto. Um, and so that's when we made the case that they should be the first responders. Um, so that, that would be about six years ago, I think, that we first started to make that case. Who do you believe should be the first responders for individuals in mental health crisis? Oh, I, I think by f having a community-based mental health crisis team is by far the best. The problem with the police is that they're trained to command and control. You go into any situation, you say, hey, lie down, put your hands up, put your hands behind your back, whatever it is to control a situation. And when they do that to somebody who's in a mental crisis, and when they're there in a big, ugly uniform with guns and tasers and batons, those people get really, really upset. So getting them out of the picture is bound to improve things. Um, and if you have someone who understands mental health crisis things, particularly people who've been through it themselves, that seems to be able to deal with those issues perfectly well. What has been the police's response when you've recommended these policies? They've just ignored them. They've always ignored them. Um, just as they've ignored the advice by Toronto City Council of a year ago saying, we want to establish this thing. And, and the police have now expanded their mobile crisis intervention team um, in, the, in the last four or five months. One of our TPAC bulletins dealt with that issue. It's just... 
So they moved in exactly the wrong direction. Um, you know, the, the police, they like their power. They, they got lots of money. They're always given all the money they want and they just spend it however they want. Has there been an example of the police using force which has been emblematic of some of these issues of having police act as first responders or people in mental health crisis? Well, the, the big one that of course stands out for me is the, the death of Albert Johnson. Albert Johnson was a black man who had mental health issues, um, well known to the police, um, well known to the community. He, he was never a danger to anybody, it just, you know, um, and the police killed him. They went into his house in 1979 and killed him. I happened to be mayor at the time. I spoke out and I said, this has got to change. We can't continue to have this kind of policy. We have to have big, serious change. That was 1979, right? That, that's 42 years ago. <laughs> we still haven't got it. I, I might say at that time I was vilified. People said, you just hate the cops. That's your problem. Yeah. And so I'm saying, I want to change, you know? So that's the one event that stands out for me. But I mean, there are many others that have happened since there where they've killed people. But he was the um, eighth person killed by Toronto police in a 13 month period in 1979. I spoke out, the police didn't kill a single person for 16 months. So it shows, you know, if you speak out, you can actually scare people into change. Uh, you know, and as soon as they got rid of me as mayor, I didn't get reelected. Uh, that, that's when they killed their first person. There's a new pilot program in the works where unarmed civilians will be the first responders for some mental health crisis calls. What's your response to this new program? Well, that's good. But in fact, they're only going to respond in cases where there's no opportunity for violence. Well, often the reason that people phone is because they're worried about violence. So um, I, I think that's wrong. And our group has opposed that very strongly. We, we've continually said, sorry, they, you know, the community people should be first responders. This is Manchester Avenue in Toronto's West End. It looks like any residential area with a local laundromat but this is the street where the Toronto police kicked in the back door of Albert Johnson's home in 1979 and shot him in front of his seven-year-old daughter. Albert Johnson's wife, Lamona, publicly said that coming from Jamaica, she didn't know who to call during a mental health crisis. She said that she wished she had called a doctor rather than the police. Tragedies like this should not take place. It's a sad reality that according to the Human Rights Commission in 2020, Black Canadians are 20 times more likely than a white person to be killed by Toronto police. The CBC reported that since the year 2000, 70% of the people who died during encounters with the police had mental health challenges, substance issues, or a combination of the two. Albert Johnson was a man who had a beautiful family, forever changed. Albert Johnson would have been 78 years old today. I'm going to introduce you to Rachel Bromberg and Asante Houghton, who both work in the mental health sector and founded an organization called the Reach Out Response Network. They have been working with the city to change the status quo when it comes to advocating for non-police-led crisis response teams in Toronto. We met up to speak about how they see this issue from their professional and lived experience. Then we just got to talking and we said, you know, the system is kind of messed up and something needs to change. Uh, both of us have lived experience, but also a lot of professional experience. And I was just having a lot of conversations with people who were calling or reaching out when they were in crisis. And I noticed that often the folks that I was talking to would tell me that, you know, they're maybe they're thinking about suicide, but they're not comfortable sharing more. Why? Well, when I would ask them why, they would be like, well, because I'm worried that if I tell you more, then you'll have to call 911 and police will show up. Maybe they'd had bad experience of, with police before. Maybe they'd heard stories about these experiences. Maybe they're just, you know, they're from a community that has historically had really negative relationships with police. 
you know, what we were seeing were people who were not getting help and being served. And I think, uh, you know, when we were talking about it, I think part of the conversation was prompted by a situation that we had at work where, you know, 911 was dialed and the police showed up. And um, we were just kind of like, is this the only answer? We really wanted to support the city in developing a framework for a new crisis service that could respond to a whole bunch of mental health crisis calls um, that are currently being responded to by police but don't necessarily need a police response. So making sure that the right person is responding to the right situation at the right time and uh, in a lot of cases that's you know unarmed crisis workers who have expertise in suicide de-escalation and risk assessment, um, crisis work, th that's who should be going to a lot of these calls. Very naively we're like well let's change it and it kind of just really started from there you know and uh, we didn't know what we were going to do or how we were going to do it but we knew that we wanted to do something that would bring about change. So we are proposing a non-police crisis service that would be staffed by mental health workers, including peer workers, people with lived experience of their own mental health crisis who have training in providing support for others experiencing similar types of crisis. Um, and we were advocating that this kind of team be available 24 seven across the city, integrated into 911 dispatch so that people calling 911 could have access to the service just because we, we know when we heard from our town halls that a lot of folks call 911 because that's that's just the number that's the only number they know that's the number they've been trained since childhood that's the number to call when you're in crisis when there's an emergency happening so making sure that it was integrated there but we also heard um, from community members that some folks don't feel comfortable calling 911 because of the strong associations between 911 and the police so we also recommended that the city make the the service available via a, a separate number that isn't 911 you know, fast forward a couple of years and George Floyd was murdered and then, you know, Regis Korchinski Paquette mysteriously fell out of a balcony and um, then there were some other high profile folks who ended up dying, uh, d you know, during wellness checks here in, here in Canada. And uh, so I guess all of these things kind of combined to open people's eyes to, uh, you know, that maybe change needs to happen in society in general. I think when folks started to die during wellness checks, it really opened the public's eyes to that, one, folks who are in mental health distress are maybe not the folks who are dangerous and maybe they're in danger. And two, I think what it really did was help people realize just how serious these situations are. And especially because though maybe not everyone talks about it, but I would think most people in society know somebody who has experienced a high level of mental health challenges. Um, and so there was that kind of personal touch and personal investment in buy-in that folks had too because they didn't want to see their friends or, or their partners or their family members or you know, maybe even themselves be harmed during uh, an interaction when they were in distress. Just heard a lot of stories about people's experiences with interactions with the police or with other emergency services and that really led me to understand that we need alternative models to be able to provide support to these folks. And also for me as a service provider, I didn't ever want to be in a position where someone was at imminent risk of suicide and I felt like I needed to contact emergency services to keep them safe, but also knowing that the people that I was calling might be stigmatizing or traumatizing for the people that I, I'm trying to help. I, I, as a worker, wanted other options. I think what we've helped to do is shift that perception to help the public and, and even politicians and those who are in, in those kinds of power positions see this issue through a different lens and see it through the lens of these folks who are experiencing mental health distress, they really, really need support and the highest level of support that we can give them. Uh, so I, I really feel like now there's more compassion and a lot more understanding and a lot more curiosity around what we can do better to help. Yeah, you know, uh, so the city of Toronto has these new pilot programs where, you know, instead of the police, crisis workers, et cetera, will be the folks showing up on the scene. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's still kind of in the, in the building phases, so we don't exactly know what it's going to look like yet. But for me, the positive is that now we're going to be moving closer toward you know, what we all desire, I think, which is to help people who need help 
as, as they need it and to give them the best help we can get. Uh, so for me, I'm excited. I think it's a first step, but with anything new, I also think that you know, we kind of have to take our time and we have to take a look at it as it goes along and you know, we're gonna have to make modifications. The biggest barrier to building these kinds of services is people's perception that these kinds of mental health crisis calls are dangerous and violent. And we know from the data that that's just not true. We know that 89% of mental health crisis calls in Ontario do not involve any type of violence, any risk of any risk of violence or any weapons whatsoever. And those are calls that are very easy to just send them to mental health workers. Mental health crisis is a health crisis. It's not a crime very unlikely to be violent and the right people to respond to a mental health crisis are mental health crisis workers. I've seen a lot of people get hurt. I've seen a lot of people not receive what they need. I've seen people end up in a, a, a spiral of, you know, sick, hospital, sicker, hospital, sickest, hospital, and then suicide, right? So, you know, I just want to help stop that cycle. And I want to start seeing sick, get help, get better. So for me, that's what it's all about. Sammy Atim was described by his friends as a sweet, skinny teenager with bright green eyes. He grew up with his sister in a middle-class Christian family in Aleppo, Syria. Sammy Atim planned to study health services management at George Brown College in the coming fall. According to his family, he did not have any mental illnesses or drug issues. Yatim took out a knife on a streetcar. No one was hurt and all the passengers were able to exit the streetcar on Dundas Street near Grace Street. Yatim stood by himself at the front of the streetcar as officers surrounded him. Then, nine shots were fired and a taser was deployed. Sami Yatim's death shook Toronto in the summer of 2013. Doing research on Sami's story, it was documented that the last thing Sami Yatim told his best friend Sasha was, Don't forget me out there. While filming, it started to rain, and right before we left, this appeared. I like to believe it was a sign. Sami Yatim sending us a message you haven't been forgotten about. I spoke to Frank Iacobucci, a former Supreme Court Justice of Canada. In 2014, he wrote an influential independent report called Police Encounters with People in Crisis, commissioned by the Toronto Police. He made 84 recommendations, including that the police should have a goal of zero deaths, a goal of no lethal force, the implementation of body cameras, the creation of a police and mental health oversight body, and to require new constables to complete a mental health first aid course. We spoke in his backyard about what he learned on the topic of how the police could improve seven years ago, and we looked into how he views the topic all these years later. I was asked to do this review, the reason being, uh, I think, it, it came out of the Sammy Yatim uh, tragedy. And there's no doubt of that. Uh, that was the, uh, you know, the, the major reason. I, there was pressure uh, on uh, all sorts of uh, people, particularly the police. And you really have to speak to a lot of people, uh, which we did, um, uh, on all s sides of the issue. There was a press conference on the release of the uh, report, and um, I was surprised because the Chief Blair said in that police council, we intend to adopt all his recommendations. Um, I w that was, of course, a form of music to one's ears uh, to have that uh, reaction. We were told many, many times by different people, well, this is going to happen, you know. People are going to die. People are going to be injured. Uh, and I just thought they had the wrong goal. The goal for me was zero. Zero deaths. If you start off with saying, well, we're going to have we're going to have uh, 
fatalities. You will have fatalities. Uh, that gets in the, to me, gets into the mindset of those who are involved in these. So I uh, kept saying, uh, why can't we, why can't we strive to say that our goal is to implement policies and execute uh, appropriately to uh, reflect our goal of zero deaths. One of the great disappointments I had in doing the review was that I had no one but from, if you like, the Department of Health uh, and uh, sort of related, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities. The Minister of Health Department didn't, I read, sent letters, would someone please be willing to talk to us from their perspective? Because hospitals are the ones that receive these people. As you know, they, they, they're they taken there and have to be uh, examined by a doctor in order to be kept. Uh, otherwise, the person is let go. And quite often, they're kept, and then they're released, and then they start it all over a revolving door. We wanted to get that perspective. We didn't. We had to get it through other ways. Uh, other, they, they did not show up, and that was a disappointment. Um, because the report was not out to get the police or to, uh, uh, and to be unrealistic and to be disrespectful. And, and I think the police community was had a very meaningful uh, reaction to me because they, they saw what I was recommending was a lot of things for them to do. But they welcomed it. That that was me very meaningful. But the subject matter that is of greatest importance is the use of force, as far as the police are concerned. Uh, but there were a lot of components uh, to that. So the use of force is, um, you know, it, it, it's a last resort. It it, it is zero deaths, you know, that kind of, all of those things that enter into that equation of uh, and that subject of, but it is it's going to the root of the matter. We don't want life-threatening results. We don't want life-ending results. Uh, and we want to be, hopefully, um, if it's a first episode, one that can lead to treatment and and uh, recovery for the individual. And there've been some there've been happy stories of, of that kind. The major message of a report like that is that you this is not it, it's never over. It, it will never be over. There, there will always be an, an, an evolution. It's a moving picture, not a photograph. And that is what I hope has been accepted. Looking inwards also requires looking outside of yourselves. That's why I want to speak with a crisis worker who has shown that alternatives to police response is possible. I spoke with Chelsea Swift from Eugene, Oregon in the United States who works for an organization called CAHOOTS. CAHOOTS stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets and it's a community initiative that began in 1989. To understand what is possible when it comes to mental health response, I wanted to learn what's taking place in other communities. For someone who might not know what CAHOOTS is, how would you explain to them what CAHOOTS does? We have the ability to take a lot of time on our calls, and we have the ability to get really, really creative. When a police officer shows up to a, a scene, they have pretty limited options traditionally of, um, you know, no action, jail, or hospital. An ambulance shows up, they have the option of resolve in the field or hospital. We are going to call friends and see if people can come over and offer support, connect people with their therapist to make sure they have that appointment that made them anxious today. 
so that we can prevent further public safety contact. We can bring people to the hospital, but when we do that, we're going to advocate at triage. We're going to hang out with them in the waiting room if they are really struggling. Um, we can transport people to it's limited, but at least we have these services like a sobering center, shelter, day centers, youth crisis centers. So we are showing up with a variety of options of how a call can end and also a variety of ways we can respond because what's really important to the CAHOOTS model that I really hope gets held onto in other places in the world, looking at alternative public safety response is that we always have a crisis worker and a medic. So the medic is at least an EMT basic, which is here like um, a three month program is pretty accessible. That's like the formal education requirement for that role. We also have some paramedics, some nurses who work with us. And then with our crisis worker role, that's a little more open-ended. We look for people who have a couple of years of experience in mental health, street outreach, harm reduction, we also have people who are really wonderful because they've had to work at like bars downtown and do conflict de-escalation in those settings. Um, we do not have a formal higher education requirement for our crisis worker roles. And I think that is really crucial in having um, really humble and accessible services, but also for us to be able to hire people who are even coming with non-traditional experience and ideals in the mental health system itself. What do you believe is the biggest difference in CAHOOTS' model of crisis response compared to armed police officers responding to mental health crisis calls? Most people, even being around police, even thinking, oh, I might have to interact with them, you are starting to negotiate what power is gonna be taken away and what impacts is that going to have on the rest of my life? I don't get paid a lot on cahoots. If I got a ticket for having a headlight out, I would be broke until my next paycheck. So even those, those economic consequences alone are enough for me to fear police. Even though it's highly likely, likely an officer that pulls me over, I would know them by name. So as long as police are responding and have handcuffs and have a weapon and have the ability to take someone's stability in life away with even something as simple as a ticket or one night in jail, that is going to affect the rest of someone's life. And just kind of going back to that, that power dynamic is what creates violence and, um, apathy or fear or over politeness or people lying and saying they're okay when they're not because if the whole time they are interacting with a police officer they are having to worry about consequence and punishment or just having to do something against their will even if it's supposed to be in service to them those interactions cannot will never be therapeutic what are your thoughts of when people question the safety of unarmed crisis workers yes Another question I think about all the time. Uh, so I think there is a lot there. There is a lot of stigma, of course, that people who are in crisis are violent. There are a lot of identities and cultures and communities, and especially BIPOC communities who are inherently perceived as being more violent. Of course, we know that those communities interact with police and public safety and carceral systems more. So at baseline, like racism, classism, marginalization, stigma gets us there where people just assume that a crisis team would be interacting with a more violent population at baseline. And then there's the piece of like, so because of that, how could people possibly show up unarmed or without being able to detain someone, physically restrain someone, um, how is that possible? For me, that is, we have, 
Hoots has operated for 32 years. We, we've never had a serious injury on our team, not just in the year where we handled 24,000 calls. In the last 32 years, no one has ever been seriously harmed. And keep in mind, like those 24,000 calls were 18% of public safety calls that came through our dispatch system in Eugene in 2019, where there was no serious injury to Cahoots worker. And that is because we show up unarmed. So the exact like paradox that people are trying to solve that we would need weapons to be safe, I can say from all sincere experience that it is because we are neutral and we're not equal. We still have power. We are still gatekeepers to use that word for resources. We are still making the recommendation or not that somebody can go to the ER we may not have any shelter options in town on a rainy night in the middle of winter and someone might see us as you have to have that how are you not able to provide that um we are bringing in a power dynamic but we are not bringing at definition a punitive one Could have all the gold in the world, but can't bring you back. That's what Regis Gorchinsky Paquette's brother, Reese, sang in a song made in tribute of his sister. She was an active kid growing up. Regis often needed nighttime car rides to fall asleep. She was a talented gymnast and dancer during her school years. She also participated in events at her local church. Regis Gorchinsky Paquette was proud of her black Nova Scotian, indigenous, and Ukrainian roots. As she grew up, within her family group chat, she was the first to post every day with an upbeat message saying, good morning, I love you. Seven years ago, she was diagnosed with epilepsy. After Regis would have seizures, she would experience drowsiness, confusion, migraines, and other disorienting symptoms. On several occasions, Regis experienced psychiatric crises that required hospital visits. The family would occasionally contact the police to help when she was having a seizure due to epilepsy. On May 27th of 2020, Regis had a seizure. The police came to their home after being called for a domestic disturbance. Claudette, Regis's mother, pleaded with the police to provide assistance to her daughter and take her to CAMH to provide mental health support. Once police arrived at the apartment, two officers blocked Korchinski Paquette from getting to her mother and brother. They eventually let Regis back into the apartment so she could use the bathroom. Regis then went out onto the 24th floor balcony and prevented officers from reaching her by holding her body against the door. According to police documents, she then tried to scale the balcony and cross onto the next door, which was when she lost her balance. She fell 24 floors. In the aftermath, her father Peter said, I've seen the mayor and the police chief just refer to as a 29-year-old woman. Her name is Regis. Just say it. In the song I spoke about, Regis's brother said, Light a candle for my sister. Make it last. For me, and for many people from Toronto, basketball is much more than a game. Asante Houghton took us back to a basketball court near his childhood home which is meaningful in his experience with his own mental health journey. He opened up about why having the police act as first responders to mental health distress acted as a barrier for getting help in his own family growing up. This is part of Asante's story. Oh man, uh, so growing up, 
you know, we never wanted to get help for our, what we were experiencing, myself personally, others in my family, with respect to mental health, because we knew that, you know, the only option was to call 911 and then police officers show up, right? And one, police officers often don't really have the tools to be able to de-escalate and support people when they're in high distress and they don't necessarily know what to do either. And it's not always because they're bad people, it's just that's not what they're trained for and that's not, you know, what their jobs are, you know, supposed to be, right? That's, that's one thing. Um, the other piece of it is, you know, when you live in a neighborhood that has a lot of community violence and, you know, other kind of elements of that nature going on, police show up to your door, you know, once or twice or three times or whatever, it kind of puts a target on your back, right? You know, other folks in the neighborhood might look at you like, hey, who are these people? The police are always coming to their door. Uh, and especially because we were so isolated as a family, no one really knew what was going on. And, you know, that kind of added this air of, you know, I don't know, you probably call it mystery, but uh, maybe skepticism from others in the community. So uh, that as well made us not want to call 911 because, uh, you know, we, we just didn't want to feel uh, an extra level of stress or, or threat or stigma from our community. Oh, it's amazing to come back here all these years later. Uh, I mean, one, I'm flooded with fond memories, but two, it's, it, it really brings me back to where I was and to come back here as a healthy and successful person, it just makes me feel like everything has come full circle. And now I'm in such a different place that uh, I could, you know, maybe support others uh, in, in, you know, in the community or others from communities that are similar to this one. Um, because I know that the support wasn't here. And for me to come back, I could say, okay, hey, I made it out. Uh, I can come back and maybe I can offer some support. But at the same time, you know, I was able to go through my stuff and, uh, you know, lucky enough to move through my challenges and, and be here today to know that my life has come full circle. Change happens when pressure becomes impossible to ignore. After years of effort, the city is taking a major step towards changing how they respond to mental health crisis. Starting in April 2022, a new pilot program will be starting in Toronto. Now, when a mental health crisis call comes to 911, a team consisting of two people, a harm reduction worker and a nurse will be the ones responding in non-violent calls. The City of Toronto has plans to implement the program across the whole city. If I ever find myself in a mental health crisis again, there will be options to respond other than the police. I spoke with the person in charge of creating this new program, Denise Campbell, over Zoom before the new program launches. It's certainly Toronto, like uh, the rest of the world, we're watching uh, the growing um, movement for racial justice um, that came as a result of um, the deaths of George Floyd and Regis Kwaczynski Paquette um, here in Toronto uh, in May of 2020. And City Council met in June 2020 to consider what could the City of Toronto do um, in response to, uh, to this global movement. And Council adopted 36 recommendations um, to create changes in policing here in Toronto. And one primary um, of those directions was to create an alternative response um, to uh, for responding to mental health um, mental health uh, crises here in Toronto. And so I was charged to make that so. Uh, so we, we began a really quick process of listening and learning uh, to come up with a model for Toronto. What has it been like for you, Denise, being the one in charge of implementing this new model of responding to mental health crisis calls across the city? Uh, you know, I have to say that this is one of the most important things um, that I believe I will ever do in my career. And so when this first started, I have to admit that there was a certain level of terror. I felt a certain level of terror about it because of its importance. And I think it's the kind of terror that comes from understanding how important this moment is, how long people have waited for an alternative that they can trust and feel safe, how urgent it is, um, and that we get one shot at doing this right. And so 
you know, I assembled a really smart, passionate team of people. And we started looking around the world and listening deeply to Torontonians. And I think the more that we learned, in some ways, the more huge and monumental the task became. Um, but I'm so proud of our work. And I think that pride in seeing how well we listen to people and how much we've learned from others to try to do better in Toronto has fortified me in all those moments where um, I've really had to uh, defend the recommendations that we have uh, created or uh, search for the resources or juggle the nuances of the many actors in the system that the city does not control but need in order to get this right. Um, and, you know, I, I'm constantly, um, grounded, I guess, in that core principle that we heard so clearly at the beginning of this, that we need to do better and we need to do no harm. What are some of the outcomes that the Community Crisis Support Service program that you're leading hopes to achieve in its work? So we are trying to build um, and achieve three things in the new Community Crisis Support Service. First and foremost, we want to ensure that Torontonians and their loved ones are supported through a mental health crisis with the right kinds of services and supports. That's job one. We also want to obviously reduce police interactions with people in crisis. So we're creating a health, health response uh, for a health situation. And then finally, we wanna be able to reduce um, the ER visits um, that a lot of people have had to uh, endure as they fall through, uh, they fall into crisis. And we want to ensure that we do that by, again, connecting them to other health and community supports. If we do those three things, I think we will have done our jobs. What further development and opportunities do you see on the horizon for advancing mental health care in Toronto through your learnings? Well, I would definitely say that um, through this work, we have been um, calling loudly to the province and to the federal government to become partners in building out a mental health response. And that all of these efforts that we're trying to do requires them to actively participate. And so we hope that they're listening and we're gonna continue at it. So I, you know, I think that's a really important um, part of the work that we're doing. Um, and you know, in this work directly, we are, I'm proud that in the model that we have, we are creating our own little bit of investment so that we can add counseling and crisis beds um, and other supports um, into the system, even though we're not gonna be able to build the system by ourselves, but at least again, we're walking our talk um, by ensuring that we're investing in that system as well. Um, you know, and I, I think this is also an opportunity um, to work differently with police, to take the pressure of mental health response off of the shoulders of police, because that's not what they're trained to do and free them up to do what they're better set to do. Uh, and if we can achieve that, again, I think that this would be extraordinary. And that's what we're set out to do. Denise, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we conclude this interview? I think maybe the only thing to add is that um, in the, you know, I worked at the city for a long time and I'm really proud to have been one of those staff who get to lead groundbreaking um, strategies and efforts by the city to create a more equitable and safer city. And this is one of those things that um, in all my time that's tapped into the sense of urgency and hope in a way that I've, I've really seen. Um, so people are hungry for it. It's long overdue and they expect us to do it better. And so that's a lot of pressure, um, but it's the right kind of pressure to make sure that we do this well. And so I am really blown away by the commitment of Torontonians and all the, um, you know, the parents, the caregivers, the nurses, um, <laughs> people have just sent a flood of calls and offers to help us think this through, um, to lend us their talents, their experience. Um, and I think that it feels like everybody is trying to, is behind us to make this possible um, and to make it excellent. 
So that's exciting. It's inspiring. And when things are difficult, you know, I hold on to that and my team holds on to that. So I really want to thank Torontonians for that inspiration and sense of urgency. A lot has changed since I began making this film. I no longer live in this home, and the city that I live in is changing before my eyes. I filmed this footage in 2019 when I wanted to become open about my mental health challenges publicly, but I never got around to putting it together because I had to be hospitalized. I will always believe that one of the greatest parts of this world is that we can change it for the better. Like anything truly worth having, time is needed. When a mental health crisis happens, it takes time to come back from it. I hope that future generations don't need to fear for their safety at their lowest. This intersection used to be a reminder of a terrible memory but making this film, I now see it as a place of healing. I'm no longer that man who sat in traffic, but rather a storyteller looking to make an impact. I want this film to serve as a memory for those who weren't as fortunate. My heart goes out to the families of Ijaz Chowdhury. Albert Johnson. Sammy Yatim and Regis Korczynski Paquette and anyone who has been hurt during a mental health crisis. Moving on isn't always easy. I believe that to heal, sometimes you need to reflect, try to move on, and keep moving forward. There have been people fighting this battle much longer than me, like former Mayor John Sewell, former Supreme Court Justice Frank Iacobucci, Chelsea Swift from Eugene, Oregon. As the city of Toronto moves forward, it symbolizes hope. Hope that past systems won't repeat itself. Hope that we can build a better city. Hope that we can create a better world for the next generation. They deserve it. For me, making this film was different than any project I've taken on before. As a storyteller, I have to be willing to tell my story if I expect others to open up to me. As I pass the street that I grew up on, I hope that wherever I go next, I'll be safe if I ever find my mind playing tricks on me again. I believe that everyone has someone they love. When we're at our lowest, we deserve care that's supportive and symbolizes how we'd want our own family to be treated. I hope that this film symbolizes that that change is possible. And for those who have experienced mental health crisis and may feel low, know that better days are possible and will come. I hope that towards the future, one day we'll look back and can't believe that this is the way we used to respond to people who need help. I believe that further progress is possible. In the end, I want to make one thing very clear. This film is not about me. It's about us.